everyone. My name is Won Hee So, um, pharmacist at Mafi. Um, today's topic is prosthetic joint infection. Let's see if I can. So, it'll be a review on the epidemiology, economical effect, etiology, pathogenesis, diagnose, diagnosis, and management. We'll focus on that. Um, think about appropriate empiric and targeted therapy. So I'll go over um, IDSA guideline from 2014, um, and here is the strengths of the recommendation and quality of evidence. So as you can see in these numbers, the three different um, registers um, and the projects, the hip and knee, um, the incidence of PJI, the annual incidence, is pretty steady over the years, the last 10 years, didn't much change, um, changed much. Um, and it is the risk is greatest within the first two years of the surgery. And um, even though um, the, the number of surgery that we do over the year had increased and patients' mortality and risk factors may have gone up uh, with just lots of surgeries, um, it can be counterbalanced with uh, improved infection control and aseptic techniques. Um, and of course, the surgical skills. So shoulder and elbow is also pretty low. So the overall cost of this infection to U.S. healthcare system is $566 million in 2009 and estimated to be by uh, more than $1 billion by 2020. Uh, if you do the debridement and retention, the cost will be threefold higher than just primary implantation. If you do the one-stage exchange, 3.4 times. If you do two-stage exchange, it'll be like six times greater the cost of the primary implantation. Because you will spend a longer duration of time in the OR, um, also including the antimicrobials associated with that um, as well. These are some of the risk factors identified um, that contribute to the infection, uh, PJI. So the obese, obese people, did because um, prolonged operation time was uh, related to the um, increased risk, diabetes mellitus uh, with a decreased vascular sufficiency, and rheumatoid arthritis, and especially the patient with um, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug, uh, they recommend to withhold especially the TNF blockers around the time of the surgery, along with the other anti-immune um, suppressive therapy, malignancy smoking, and other types of uh, prosthesis, and cemented versus uncemented um, surgery. Uh, there's actually controversial data, um, and they don't really see much difference if you use cemented, but theoretically, if you can put antimicrobials into the cement, um, you could probably, um, you can speculate, maybe they will reduce the infection, but they didn't really see the difference in the studies. And perioperative infection at a distant site can cause hematogen seeding into the prosthesis and can cause infection. So try to treat those infections, including the urinary tract infection. However, the study found that if you have asymptomatic bacteria, not real um, true like urinary tract infection with the symptoms, they did not appear to be associated with the increased PJI. Therefore, there is no need for pre-op um, urinalysis and urine culture for this, uh, before this surgery. Um, and again, the length of the surgical procedures, um, of course, related to the risk factor. So most common symptom is the pain. So most frequently um, reported the clinical symptom is the pain. The presence of the soft tissue damage um, was more common in the contiguous or um, preoperatively uh, acquired infection versus the hematogenously acquired infection. And, um, but it doesn't distinguish between the aseptic failure, like a loosening or dislocation or malfunction of the processes with the actual infection. Joint swelling or fusion has been seen, erythema. You can see fever, but not all the time. But if you have acute infection and um, if the PJI is from the hematogen seeding, you see more common. Um, and then you can see the drainage and the presence of the sinus tract. So sinus tract will have this drainage. 
um, coming off from the hardware in place, like in this picture. So people had classified um, based on the timing after the surgery to the infection. So early infection is considered less than three months. Um, delayed is between three months to one year or two year. Late is greater than one year or two year. Uh, it's kind of important to understand. And then the bottom um, section have time to infection and the mode of infection together, but they are actually very similar. So for early infection within the three months, uh, it can mostly happen through the intra-op contamination by relatively virulent uh, microorganism. Uh, versus if you have a delayed um, onset, you probably had still um, have an infection from the contamination from the OR, but by uh, less virulent organisms. So what could be those? Versus the first early onset can be caused by mostly what kind of organisms? early yeah and then for the more delayed yeah and what else could it be like anaerobes yes yes and then uh, the late um, onset is greater than one year and mostly through the hematogenous infection comes with a step aureus uh, bacteremia uh, or gram negative ROS. Uh, may also be due to extremely indolent infection that's initiated from the OR at the time of the surgery. So um, the second um, classification is very similar, but again, emphasizing, okay, you just found it in the intra-op. Um, and then the, the, the second one is early post-op infection within one month, greater than one month. And it's important to understand because then the causing um, microbiology changes. So the initiation of the infection mostly happens um, during the OR, um, or the soft tissue infections can, um, again, infect the prosthesis uh, by contiguous spread or hematogenous seeding. Um, it's rare, but higher risk with a step aureus infection. Uh, also noted in, in other types of bacteremia, coag negative staph, strep, enterococcus, or aerobic gram negative ROS, also been um, spread by the hematogenous seeding. Um, it's it's a hard to get rid of this infection without surgery, um, and it is a key component because of this biofilm and antimicrobial activity is compromised due to the biofilm. The biofilm can be monomicrobial or polymicrobial, but it, it'll have um, several different sets of subpopulation with a different susceptibility pattern to antimicrobials. And um, they will attach to the surface, they will grow, and they will uh, make the antibi antibiotic penetration extremely hard, and they will, they will get detached, and uh, they can be, um, you know, they can be spreading through, through the surface. Um, hmm. Oh, so uh, there is one drug that we use for the, to prevent, um, help with the uh, staphylococcal biofilm, and what is that drug that we use for the, yes, so that is the rifampin, and not just the step aureus, um, pseudomonas, gram-negatives, uh, coag-negative staphs, and acinobacter, other gram-negatives um, had caused, had um, ability to form the biofilm. So this is the heat prosthesis, um, the picture. So you can see there are more fluid, um, there are more dislocation, or there are um, the gas, if you see, on those surrounding, um, surrounding area of the prosthesis, um, then you can suspect um, infection. And the infection mostly uh, starts from the head of the, the upper part of the metastasis, metaphysis because, um, because of what? Yeah. So the, um, during the surgery, it can be contaminated and it's more um, exposed. And um, it can start from the top, but the hematogenous um, start from the, where the areas with the more vascular supplies. So it could start from the diaphysis and go up. Uh, this is a patient with a 65-year-old 
orthopedic hardware place also less than one month ago in the left ankle presented with redness of the leg constitutional symptoms swelling redness pain um, examination revealed a sinus tract draining purulent material that was culture positive for coag negative step patient is currently on long-term suppression with the oral antibiotic waiting for hardware to be removed so the question is what is your diagnosis <laughs> and what is the likely organism that caused this infection is that the coag negative staph that caused it you have a sinus tract positive culture with the coag negative staph what do you think and the surgery was within one month and patient not septic, pretty stable other than the local symptoms. What do you say? Yes, step urea is definitely in the differential, right? Um, and can you take that culture as, you know, can you target it towards that coag negative staff? If you identified it from the sinus tag? That's the question that we are going to try to answer through this uh, presentation. And what kind of antibiotic do you want to start? Or do you even start the antibiotic at this point? For example, like surgery is planned three weeks later after the presentation. Would you give him antibiotic? Uh, right now, um, the case said the patient was on the oral suppression therapy. Is that really necessary? Uh, what kind of imaging would you order? Any question? Any comments? What kind of imaging should we order? MRI, CT. Um, what are the blood tests would you order? Blood culture. What patient that have? Yeah, no fever, no hemodynamic instability. Yeah, so these are the questions we're trying to answer through the presentation. So this shows the most common causes of the prosthetic joint infection microbiology-wise. So the, in the early infection, these two up top have most commonly identified. And they will be? <laughs> yes, yeah, step aureus and coag negative staph. And as you can see, um, aerobic gram negative rust and also polymicrobial infections are pretty common. If you think about contamination from the OR, the polymicrobial is common. Uh, you can see here strep species also had caused the problem, enterococcus species possible. Uh, but enterococcus mostly is identified in a polymicrobial infection and um, the more rare cause of the early infection in this setting. The coag negative stab, again, um, in early infection, like less than three months, it's 22%. Um, so it's less than the step aureus, but it still remains uh, pretty high. And then in the delayed um, onset, step aureus also is ident identified pretty commonly. So again, the leading cause of PJI is step aureus, not coag negative step, especially in an acute setting. Um, and if you have the indwelling prosthetic device, injection drug users, receipt of hemodialysis, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, um, and step aureus nasal colonization, these people have a risk factor for the step aureus PJI. And uh, 10 to 60% of the concomitant bacteremia, uh, patients have a concomitant bacteremia. And usually shows very acute presentation compared to the other bug, considering the virulence of this organism. Next, causative organisms, um, coag negative staph. So what is the most commonly identified coag negative staph for the PJI infection? Yeah, it is epi. Uh, it adheres to the, the materials, and it does cause um, biofilm formation. And um, what is the coag negative staph that has a virulence like, similar to the step aureus, uh, susceptible to penicillin? present with acute pain and swelling. Which one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, lugdanensis. Yeah, so with the exception of lugdanensis, oxacillin resistance is found in majority of the coag negative staph, but um, this one could be susceptible to penicillin. 
as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this can be identified in both acute and the delayed setting. Next, uh, strep, um, less than 10% of the PJI, but it has been identified. Metal hemolytic strep uh, typically present with acute presentation. This one, formerly known as a strep vobis, also is associated with a colorectal malignancy. Just a little micro pop quiz. Yeah, Gallolyticus. And then uh, Virdan strep and strep pneumonia which will be pretty rare to see MAFI, the strep pneumonia, can also cause PJI. This one um, cause delayed or late onset. Um, patient mostly have comorbidities like obesity, malignancy, uh, mostly hematogenous with the GU, GI, skin being the most common source, source bacteremic at the onset of the PJI. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so this one, um, yeah, so this one patient comes with mostly with a bacteremia, 50, up to like 50%, um, the acute kind of infection. That will be like group B strep. Uh, group G mostly um, associated with the remocyte cellulitis. Uh, continuing the causative microorganisms, Enterococcus um, had been, um, you know, responsible for 12% to 15% of the early onset infection, usually part of the polymicrobial infection, and the late onset hematogen seeding uh, from GI or GU tract uh, possible. Um, and then aerobic gram-negative ROS, mostly common in the early um, onset PJI, as I showed in the table earlier, it could be mono or polymicrobial if it's early onset and um, caused by the contamination. Uh, and you can see E. coli, enterobacteria, C, pseudomonas, and typically it shows the um, acute presentation because they are very virulent. Um, this is a relatively low virulence anaerobic gram positive ROS that's been associated with about 10% maybe of the PJI. Um, it's a normal flora of the skin, typically inoculated during the surgery, but um, show up in a later um, time frame because it's very indolent. Um, it's challenging to diagnose because it's a slow grower, uh, takes up to 14 days. Um, fewer um, clinical symptoms, so it shows normal ESR, CRP, lack of acute inflammation, contaminant versus infection needs to be considered when you isolate this organism. So what is this one? Gram-positive ROS, that's common? Yes, that's Propionibacterium acne. Continuing with the other anaerobes, uh, Clostridium species, not just the uh, other Clostridiums, C. diff has been associated with the PJI in a, you know, several different sites. Uh, Bacteriodes uh, fragilis, Peptostreptococcus, actinomyces also been associated with the PJI. I just wanted to, um, so what is the treatment for the PJI uh, C. diff associated? Has anybody seen it? 
I guess it's pretty rare, but it is common. So I'm going to just read off the, the history here, and then you can see what was the end of the story. Um, so at the age of 58, the patient underwent a total left knee arthroplasty. At 25 months after her knee replacement, she underwent arthroscopic surgery to remove a large amount of scar tissue from the treated knee, and then the culture had pseudomonas. She was treated with ceftriaxone and oral ciprofloxacin for months. At 26 months after receiving her prosthetic knee, it was removed and her left leg was put in an immo immobilizer for seven months. Second artificial knee was placed at 33 months, but the patient's knee remained swollen and tender. Um, after second artificial knee was removed five weeks after the implant implantation. During the removal of the patient's second artificial knee, this was after the prolonged um, use of antibiotics. Samples were of tissue and fluid aspirates from the patient's left knee uh, were collected. It was PCR positive for C. diff. Uh, following the removal of her second artificial knee, the patient was treated with IV josin for four weeks, then for three weeks of flagell. So I'm not sure why. Uh, Josin was used, but that's what they did. Um, and patient experienced worsening pain, stiffness, erythema in the left leg. Three weeks after the removal of the second prosthetic knee, she developed sepsis and with frequent fever associated with lightheadedness, nausea, accompanied of alter mental status. So at 36 months, what was her solution? <laughs> Do we have any drug for this? <laughs> yeah, patient was sepsis, so they actually amputated her. Um, knee below so and I tried to do some literature search if there is any use of any other drugs I didn't really find anything I'm not sure why in this case they use the Josin uh, versus Flagyl up front but is Flagyl really effective for the non-colonic extra um, uh, CDF infection it's questionable apparently you know you cannot use the oral Venco um, so yeah the yeah so um, options will be pretty limited, and uh, surgery should be the key part of the um, treatment for this infection. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> microbial culture and ana analysis by PCR is a two culture from the femur group, sparse colonies of C deep. Um, yeah, on the anaerobic medium. Yeah, and then they did the PCR. Uh, let me see. New York. <laughs> yeah, polymicrobial infections. Um, yeah, responsible for up to 35% of the early onset infection. Um, if you have higher morbidity index, age greater than 65 years old. Um, I guess your immune system is compromised. You cannot really clear some minor contaminants. Um, the other bacteria listed here um, have uh, reported to cause the PJI infection. Uh, mycobacterium, including TB, um, has been reported. But if you have a hi uh, if you didn't have any history of inactive or latent tuberculosis, um, it could still occur. Uh, but non-TB um, Mycobacteria rarely causes PJI. Um, Mycobacterium avian complex mostly MAC, um, mostly reported in the HIV AIDS patient. Fungi also had a cause the PJI, but less than one percent. Pretty rare. Um, and then we're going to switch gears to diagnosis. Uh, mostly we'll go by the IDSA guideline. So when patient first present, um, and you can suspect the PJI in these type of patients. If you have a sinus tract and a persistent wound drainage, acute onset of pain, so that's the most common symptoms. You don't, you ne you don't necessarily have um, swelling or um, other fever or other symptoms. And chronic painful prosthesis uh, without pain-free interval. So you have to distinguish between aseptic failure uh, versus the actual infection, but something to consider. Um, in the first few years following the surgery, you see it more commonly, um, especially less than two years. And prior history of wound healing problems. 
Um, so when you examine the patient, look at the type of prosthesis, date of implantation, again, it's important in terms of understanding the etiology, past surgeries on the joint, uh, past the history of antimicrobial use, um, symptoms, blah, blah, and then uh, prior cultures if uh, surgery was done before. And do you always have to get the ESR or CRP? Yeah, they say it's A3, so based on pretty good information, based on a randomized clinical trial. But it says it's not clinically, when the diagnosis is not clinically relevant, that you will get it. The sensitivity and specificity uh, for ESR and CRP is listed there. They're not perfect. They're not like reaching 90%. And uh, the studies have used different threshold. Um, and then the time from the last revision surgery and the joint involved um, influenced the test performance. Um, so you have to interpret it based on what kind of reference you're using and what kind of threshold they've been using. So it's not like a set in stone. And then IDSA guideline, they don't actually give you the recommendation for what should be the threshold that you will suspect this infection. Um, so in terms of radiology, again, what do you want to order? It says plain radiograph, right? So you'll order the x-ray to identify non-infectious causes. Um, uh, but other than that, they don't really recommend any more um, aggressive um, radiology. Um, Arthrocentesis um, is recommended unless the diagnosis is evidence, evident and surgery is planned and antimicrobials can be safely withheld prior to surgery. Um, so again, the, from the synovial fluid analysis, uh, based on the two studies, I list, made this table. So for the total nucleated cell count for knee, they used a cutoff of 1,100, neutrophil differential 64%, and sensitivity and specificity is um, close to 90, greater than 90% or a little less specificity uh, with the knee study. So these are the ballpark numbers that you can keep in mind uh, to suspect this true infection. Um, uh, yeah, so when you, um, when you have this fluid aspirate, um, send it for culture for aerobes and the anaerobes, because anaerobes can have caused the infection, um, can be determined um, if the pre -op, uh, peri op antimicrobials, which one can be used based on this culture, and then construction of the PMMA um, antimicrobial loaded polymethyl methacrylate. Um, it can be loaded into the cement and put it in um, during the surgery. So there are some commercially available ones. There are the surgeons could um, also make it during the operation as well. In stable patient, we hold antibiotics for um, greater than two weeks prior to the surgery to um, increase the yield of the intra-op culture. Blood culture, if a fever, febrile patient have acute symptoms um, of other concomitant infections like bacteremia. Imaging studies, MRI, CT, PET-CT should not be routinely used. Um, and I have some details of the numbers. But um, they basically say if you have a good clinical exam, um, this uh, sensitivity doesn't really get increased over um, what you can get from the clinical exam. So not really recommended strongly. Uh, in the intra-op, you have to do the histopathological exam um, if there is any neutrophil infiltrate and um, at least three and optimally five to six intra-op um, tissue samples should be sent for the culture in both aerobic and anaerobes. And again, antimicrobials ideally should be held um, two weeks prior to the collection. And again, uh, this is a question about the, we had a sinus tract in a patient, right? And then the culture had a coag negative step. Um, should we um, use that culture as our guidance for antimicrobial therapy? No? <laughs> yes. So the swab culture obtained um, 
uh, during surgery. So while the presence of sinus tract itself is the evidence of uh, definitive evidence of the PJI, swab culture, the drainage from the sinus tract is neither sensitive or specific. Uh, when you compare it with the actual tissue from the periop uh, during the intraop tissue culture, so concordance between the superficial sinus tract culture um, with the intraop culture was only 53%. If you identify the step aureus, the concordance actually increased a little bit, but it was not really always matched. So you should not um, use the, you know, the sinus tract culture as a guidance for your antimicrobials, and collection for swab, therefore, is not recommended. Um, guideline briefly talks about the sanification of the removed prosthesis. So if you, um, you removed it and you put it in a broth, that grows everything, you have a high rate of contamination. So some people came up with this protocol. So in these people at Mayo Clinic, they put it in a storage container, and then they'll put a ringo solution, and then they'll vortex it. That will cause the biofilm to detach from the prosthesis, and then they'll centrifuge, they'll aspirate the um, sanificate fluid, and then they'll culture it on the agar. And the sensitivity and specificity from this kind of procedure was actually higher than the periostatic uh, tissue culture. So there are several different um, protocols. I think in Mayo they always do it. But, and then there are like several different, um, so the sanification itself is not in one of the guidelines, like recommended, uh, recommendation in the IDSA, but it's in their evidence section. So I don't know if Mafi does it actually. Yeah, they put it, so depending on it, either you put it in a sterile container, solid, versus if you put it in a bag, um, the sensitivity specificity change again. So they recommend it in like a solid container. Yeah, and then the, another question is what kind of cutoff you use um, to prevent to call too many things as a true pathogen versus contaminant. So it's like a working process. If we ever use this, we have to really thoroughly examine uh, what kind of contamination rate they had at sudden threshold. So depending on what kind of society's guideline you look at, musculoskeletal uh, versus international consensus versus IDSA have a little bit of different um, definition of the prosthetic joint infection. They all have the presence of the sinus tract communicating with the prosthesis as the definitive evidence of the infection. Identified organism isolated two or more cultures. Um, and then there is some supportive evidence, as you can see here. So this is just a repeat of the previous slide. Um, the purulence itself, uh, without an unknown cause of etiology, you should um, suspect the PJI, but it's not a definite evidence, definite um, definition. Uh, for the intraop culture, equal or greater than two intraop culture or combination of pre-op aspiration or intraop culture. Growth of the virulent organism like a step aureus, beta hemolytic strap, or gram negative rise in a single specimen will um, define the PJI versus if you have one sample out of five, uh, coag negative stab or P acne, you may think that could be the contaminant. Um, yeah, the third bullet point is the same thing that I mentioned. The sinus tract culture should not be taken as a guidance for antimicrobial therapy. Management. Uh, so depending on the duration of the, uh, uh, the time from the surgery to the onset of the infection, uh, you'll think about different etiology and how well the prosthesis is maintained. Is it well fixed? Is there any sinus tract? Um, and then the identified organisms can be managed with a long-term oral antimicrobial therapy or not. Um, if yes, um, then maybe you can keep it with a debridement and retention. If no, um, recommended to remove the prosthesis. If the prosthesis itself is old, then um, they also again recommend to remove. 
The, in the US, we do mostly the two stage, uh, meaning you will remove it first, give antimicrobial, and give some time to clear the infection completely, and then place the second implantation. So that's called the sta two stage. Um, if your patient have a poor soft tissue, difficult to treat organisms, so you do need antimicrobial for a prolonged period of time to get rid of the infection before you put in the second one. Um, those all um, be eligible for the two stage exchange versus the one stage mostly used in Europe and mostly studied in the hip arthroplasty, um, not knee or others. But I bet um, in Europe they use mostly um, in all kinds of um, arthroplasty surgery. And you should have a good soft, good soft tissue, identify the organism uh, pre-op and the good bone stock and those um, organisms should be susceptible to the oral agent. So you just change it all at once and then just give uh, susceptible um, antimicrobials anti after the one stage exchange. Uh, this is just a repeat of what I just said. It just shows the picture of the two stage. So you see the infection. They'll get rid of uh, everything and uh, make the debridement. Um, and then you can put the spacer to uh, before you have the second implant. Um, and then you can also put the cement during the surgery to have the antimicrobial to be released um, and prevent further infection. So this is a step. So during the first surgery, uh, you will um, get rid of all the infected tissues, components, PMMA, removal, um, and the spacer is implanted in the joint space. And then after that, uh, four to six weeks of antibiotic, um, then two to six weeks of antibiotic free time. And during this time, you will um, see if there is any residual infection. Um, you can do the synovial fluid as parade, inflammatory markers like CRP and ESR and see what the trend is. And if there is a further debridement needed or further antibiotic, prolonged um, antibiotic is needed, then you will treat it. And second surgery, ideally you will not see any, any more infection and you'll put a new one. Uh, however, the recommendation is frozen sectional analysis should be done, and if it shows negative inflammation, then you'll have a reimplantation. New processes is implanted typically using the antimicrobial loaded PMMA, and uh, if uh, um, the final culture from this second culture, second surgery, um, is negative. Um, then you will just continue antimicrobial until you have finalized negative culture. If the culture is positive, then you have to continue the antibiotic for a very period of time. Uh, so that will be a very unfortunate case. So um, just so briefly about the antimicrobial loaded PMMA spacer, it provides the mechanical support. Um, also, we can provide the local antimicrobials. Uh, most commonly used antimicrobials are aminoglycosidin or tobramycin and vancomycin. So here I said vancomycin 1 to 3 gram, but depending on the reference you look at, some people advocate for 3 to 4 gram of vancomycin in 40 gram of PMMA versus a little bit lower dose of gen and tobra, 1.2 to 4.8 gram. Um, basically I'll explain this um, surgical intervention. So one stage, uh, non, non commonly done in the US, may be considered in the total hip because that's where the most studies come out. Um, and of course, after aggressive debridement, um, you can put uh, uh, PMMA, uh, antimicrobial loaded PMMA to fix a new arthroplasty in place. So the PMMA can be used both in the one stage and the two stage. Um, this is just the case for the permanent resection. If you have a limited bone stock, poor soft tissue coverage, infectious due to highly resistant organisms, um, you'll just resect it and don't put anything else. And then have a hi hi um, history of the previous two stage exchange. So I really like this. Um, figure that summarizes the medical management of this infection. So DAIR is debridement, antibiotic, implant retention, and then OSC is the one stage exchange. Um, ALC is antimicrobial loaded cement. Um, 
and that's what it stands for. So if you look at the debridement and, and um, process retention, it's, just, it's done in a single surgery. Um, and it's a solid implant. Uh, you have a very short duration of the symptoms, so the prosthesis itself is not highly colonized or infected with these organisms. And then the organism that you identify is highly susceptible to the antimicrobial therapy. So usual duration is usually four to six weeks. Um, either it's a stab or other gram-negative rods or anaerobes, usually it's four to six weeks. However, if you add rifampin for the biofilm uh, penetration, you can reduce the um, anti-stab um, IV therapy to two to six weeks. And then after you're done with the IV therapy, um, they recommend um, good oral agent with um, combined with the rifampin. So for knee, it's recommended for six months. All the others, like a hip, shoulder, elbow, ankle, recommended for six months. And after that, uh, without the rifampin, if you just want to use the prolonged use of oral antimicrobials, there's not much guideline when you can stop. So in our ortho doctors, they use the ciprodoxy forever, right? Um, but there's really not much guideline to um, recommend the escalation or stop the antibiotic um, currently available um, in the literature. Any comment about this? So in I see. Yeah, so my question is if you have frozen analysis shows neutrophils, so you may have possibly an infection, you still go ahead and do it. And that's what it seems like. You still go ahead and do it and then continue the antibiotic.
you for the comment. And then going with the uh, one-stage exchange, so after the debridement, um, um, you will, um, and then prosthesis is exchanged already at one stage, and then you'll continue the antibiotic again to four to six weeks. But if combined with the rifampin, the IV therapy can be reduced to two to six weeks, um, total of three months. And then oral suppressive therapy, again, here is controversial, and there's no um, data for limiting the duration. Uh, Two-stage exchange, um, during the first surgery, you will remove everything. You will um, get the tissue debrided, um, but then you'll put the spacer to keep the um, you know, patient's comfort. And uh, pathogen-directed therapy, in this case, is four to six months, I mean, four to six weeks, and then two um, or more weeks of um, observation of antibiotic to see if the residual infection is all cleared. And we did discuss about you will do the frozen section. If it's positive for any signs of infection, you will delay the surgery again and um, probably put more cement or other things to hold off, hold on um, to the process before the second process is implementation. Yeah, so we'll definitely need the help from the pathologist in that regard. Uh, yes, and then on the permanent resection, um, after um, after the resection, again the antibiotics are recommended for four to six weeks. After the amputation, um, you'll think that you not need any more antibiotic, but if there is any any residual tissues uh, remaining after the amputation, you will then continue on with antibiotics. So this summarizes everything that I, uh, my, um, you know, other slides uh, stating here. So that's all I have today. And then we can finish up with the prevention. Uh, the IDSA also has the you know, dosing recommendations. Again, the propionic bacterium, is that susceptible to flagell? What is like the first line therapy? Yeah, penicillin and vancomycin, and sometimes uh, minocycline works, but not the flagell. Uh, so if you're diabetic, uh, try to control your sugar. Smoking cessation has been related to the risk of PJI, so recommend um, smoking cessation. Infections at other sites need to be treated before the surgery. Um, Period management of the arthritis patients with the DMARS to, should be held, and there are specific guidelines depending on their pest, um, depending on their half life, uh, maybe from the package insert, um, how long you should hold around the surgery. Uh, reduction of the skin flora using the MRSA decolonization has been implemented at Moffitt. However, the data are conflicting. Most um, benefit was seen in a thoracic surgery. Um, in the ortho patient, there is a trend towards the uh, improvement. Uh, after the, the decolonization, the skin and soft tissue infection was decreased. However, it didn't really have a uh, statistically significant difference. Uh, Periab antimicrobial prophylaxis should be done uh, with the cefagulin. Mostly covers the gram negatives and um, MSSA, so it's a good agent. Um, however, if your patient's not really septic, uh, no fever, very stable, should hold the antibiotic until you have operative culture. Antimicrobial loaded the PMA for prevention. The doses are a little bit lower than when you try to treat it with this um, PMMA um, um, loaded with antimicrobials, but it's listed there, um, around the one or two gram of antibiotics per 40 gram of PMMA. And for dental procedures, um, traditionally people have been using the prophylaxis prior to the dental procedures, but recently more data suggests that there is no increased risk of PJI following either low or high risk dental procedure. Antimicrobial prophylaxis given before the dental procedure does not decrease the risk of the infection, therefore 
uh, it is no longer recommended. It's just uh, FYI for the stewardship standpoint. So on this patient, so patient had PJI, right? Sinus tract with a recent placement of the hardware on the ankle. Likely organisms, we went through that. Step aureus, coag negative step, um, gram negative possible, polymicrobials all possible. Initial antibiotics, should we, should we give it based on this culture? No, right? We can wait until the intra-op culture and then target based on that. Uh, imaging, so we know that the you know chest X, uh, the X-ray is just recommended, not the MRI or the CTs highly recommended. Um, and then we also discussed the prophylactic measures to prevent this infection. With that, that's all I have. Any comments or questions?